Thanks for joining me for another Blunt Business on CannabisRadio.com. Really appreciate all of you joining us. If you haven't done so, if you haven't subscribed to the show yet, please do so. Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and please rate and review the show. So imagine in the legal market of the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., would you be surprised there is a meat glass dominated the storefront, especially called Monco, M-O-N-K-O, along K Street. And I've always heard about K Street. That's where all the lobbyists are. All the money's there, all the influence to, you know, our bidders in the Capitol Hill or the White House. And the person of said store, Monco, actually is there. I'm fascinated with what he is able to go and do in terms of what's being done in terms of from a business owner standpoint and an advocacy standpoint. I'm here and happy to go and welcome the CEO and founder of cannabis lifestyle brand, Monco, and the chairman of the I-71 committee, Terrence White. Terrence, thanks for being on. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. K Street. You couldn't, I mean, talk about location, location, location. First of all, just being put in in the same breath as your store is very well seen along that corridor. Talk to me about just the fact of being able to have, have any spot in D.C., such an influential spot, such a spot of power, and, and what do you see around the storefront around you and who comes into the store? Well, it's an honor, first of all, being with you today. Um, yeah, so when I started this journey, I wanted to, I'm a real estate guy, so location was everything. And, you know, I wanted to take the stitch, stitch and stigma off of cannabis. So what not a better location than K Street? Um, I'm in the Mount Vernon Triangle area of, of here in the District of Columbia. This area used to be very impoverished, drug fested, uh, prostitutes, a lot of things. Now the average income in the area is about 160 grand a year. Um, so um, that gave us the luxury lifestyle brand, which is Monco, to put this location here um, so that we could show not only the district, but the country that um, not only can cannabis survive on K Street, but a person of color uh, like myself uh, could have a business on K Street. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm sure that the area right now is far removed than what it was when Marion Barry was mayor. I can imagine how long and how much changes happened to that area. So when you're talking about it, that, you know, in D.C., it's been a very difficult uh, path for legal cannabis to go across and how what's being allowed. So you're a lifelong D.C. resident, and you had been an informally incarcerated citizen, as you call it. And you said, mentioned about how laws surrounding cannabis have changed, recognition of it being in a healthy, active lifestyle, but you can still find places in the district where you can buy cannabis, still illegal, or get a lower quality product. And what you want to do was definitely put something of a higher level to fit where, I mean, there's so much money that's being put in D.C. I mean, there's obviously, I mean, without saying who, the demographic, the makeup of those that are coming into the storefront, what can you tell me? Do you definitely, absolutely, definitely see policymakers or those that are underneath those policymakers that are definitely visiting the store? Absolutely. Um, we see policymakers, staff. Uh, we see uh, on the local as well as the federal government side. Um, but, you know, being I-71 and being a truly gifted, gifting store, um, you know, cannabis is 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 the safe haven for those who want to um, have adult use. And, you know, not only policymakers, but we see a lot of uh, influence uh, people, uh, not only, uh, you know, of, you know, white, black, brown. We see we see them all. Um, the, the, the thing is, is that the beauty of of having this location um, allows people who want to live a cannabis lifestyle um, and get a quality product, um, and they know that it's going to be in a safe environment, and that's the that's the biggest thing that they feel they understand the experience of walking and and doing business with Monco because that's what we thrive on the experience. And on top of that, with DC. So many issues where there's always been with those policymakers that might be coming to the store. There are those that have also gone on and have made it difficult for what the public in the District of Columbia has wanted. Going back to 1998, 
when the initial medical marijuana shift was passed. And then it took 11 years to get it to be implemented. And then the same thing going with 2013 Initiative 71, legalizing possession up to two ounces of cannabis, ability to gift up to one ounce, personal cultivation of a small number of plants. And also that trying to go and get across with the issues going along with that. Meanwhile, with all the obstacles, the market has gotten, as of last year, sales $56 million, quite a quite an offshoot right there for that. And one of the things is that DC, and because of I-71, it's the role model, the catalyst that should be passed across across the state, or state to state and across the country. You, what have you gotten so far for those that have looked to take what that initiative has done and trying to give as much freedom as possible for those to go enjoy cannabis? Well, you know, being the chairman of our semi-one committee, the first thing was we wanted as a as an organization and as a group, we wanted to make sure that our voice was heard. And so when I came on, we wanted, you know, the the, the, the things was we were fighting from beyond the shadows, behind the shadows. Um, no one wanted to put a face. And I told them that I was um, willing to step from behind the shadows and fight with local um politicians, advocacy, uh, groups that were fighting against um, be cannabis being free will in, in the district. So what we wanted to do as a group um, and what I wanted to do as a chairman was step up and say, hey, who, who can we get number one on council that supports us and understands where cannabis, not only in DC, but across the country is going? Because this is just not a DC thing or a Maryland thing or a Virginia thing or a DME thing. This is across the can a country when we're talking about medical use and we're talking about adult use. So we have to understand the difference between the two. But the I seventy one community understood that hey, as when DC wrote this law, you go back to nineteen ninety eight. You talk about when it first was initiated. The Department of Health did not want cannabis to be legal. So there were laws and bylaws written that that affected that and still affect those businesses today. As we talk about the fifty six million dollars that was made last year, D.C. is capable of making six hundred and fifty million dollar a year industry in the cannabis. It's all if they will allow free will. And when I say free will, if we allow us to operate like a California or Colorado, um, like our counterparts, in Massachusetts or even next door in Maryland, if we allow, uh, if we take that from, if the district takes that attitude, if we liberal enough to understand that that's where cannabis, the industry is going, that's what the culture is going. And so for us as the I-71 committee, that's what our challenges have been to let, to understand how to bring what other states, how to replicate that and bring it to D.C. so that we can have a robust or a, a thriving industry. And that's what I've been fighting for. That's what my counterparts have been fighting for, for us to not only have a license, um, but for us to be in a thriving business. And and that's been a hurdle. Um, it's not been easy, but it's the fight um, that I, I got to the table. It's the fight that I fight every day. Yeah. Uh, for return citizens, for black and brown, um, and for non-black and brown people who want to be part of this industry. Um, the cannabis industry, and I'm sorry for going on, is the new industry. It's the new alcohol. But we have to understand there's no banking behind this as of yet. So the laws here are always constrained because there's when when there's commerce without when there's commerce without banking, there's an issue. And, and that's what we have to recognize first and foremost, that we have to get banking in place so that not only the legislators can get comfortable, but those naysayers can get comfortable because now you get to regulate things. And as you know, this country is all about commerce, regulations and how the dollar is going to flow. And that's what, that's what we've been fighting against. Now, stay tuned. We have more Blunt Business coming up after a short break. Rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more Blunt Business. On this program and on our Blunt Business program, which I'm both host, you know, we've talked to a bunch of 
councils, organizations that are always constantly trying to go ahead and have communications with the federal government, with policymakers that can really be lobbied and pushed across to get more help in cannabis, where it's the Safe Banking Act, whether it's you know the DEA looking to reschedule from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 to federal legalization through the state sector, whatever act you want, the more act. The thing is, you have the real advantage of proximity and for, for the fact that you're not one of these organizations. I mean, I-71 obviously is an association that is well noticed within the city itself, and you're the closest and probably what, I mean, I imagine with the fact that your store is there and other I-71 stores are in the same proximity, being able to go ahead and meet some of these people within K Street or others that are coming in that can influence or curry favor to get to the policymakers and maybe, listen, the lobby money doesn't matter so much. How about we get cannabis to be passed in terms of what political capital is gained from it as opposed to what's being put in a politician's pockets? What have you had a chance to do in terms of being in the area on a regular basis? And if you've had the chance through I-71, the committee, as a chairman or just as a business owner, the chance to talk or communicate with some of those policymakers about what can be done to help offer more relief from a tax benefit or just from a benefit for the for the, the public out there to be able to get, get their hands on cannabis because it helps in so many ways. Well, you know, the, the big hurdle here is 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 state local level or territory. DC is a territory versus federal, right? So if you look at the hurdles, uh, last year I did a Congressional Black Caucus event where we had uh, local and state officials and we we brought, you know, what, what we were bringing is knowledge, facts. We And that's when the Safe Bank Act um, wouldn't, hadn't gotten out, mm -hmm. wouldn't, out of committee. Um, within a year what we've been doing or what I've been doing is advocating behind the scenes doing advocating. Uh, I just, um, uh, joined, uh, initiative veteran initiative 22, which takes, uh, veterans from pills to plants doing these type things and, and aligning myself with the organizations who are fighting for the safer bank act who are fighting for for deschedulizing cannabis or decriminalizing cannabis, that's what we do every day. Whether it's on a whether it's on a, a local level or on a federal level, the you have to continue to push the envelope and continue to push the message. The message is here is is 1984. The Supreme Court said cannabis is medically legal to cure certain diseases, right. but we still face incarceration. We still face this descheduling thing from cannabis. Why is cannabis a schedule one drug? But it's medically, it's been proven that it's a medical healing plant. So there's been a lot of issues with the DC Council in terms of the the, the back and forth about uh, where the I 71 committee has been working to help to support what the voters want about not shutting down the I 71 gifting shops. One of the years that I talked about from the that I saw from the Washingtonian was they talked about how where the issues are because of the federal meddling that the cannabis industry is populated by an array of so-called I-71 businesses or gifting uh, that have advantage of the law's gifting provision to look and act like marijuana sales operations without actually selling the cannabis legacy operators, basically, which it's a different, that's a different scenario than it is in any other state. Because all the other states want to go ahead and offer provisional licenses for social equity, which is wonderful. But how much are they serving towards the legacy operators? And your the District of Columbia, where you are and what the committee that you're serving for, this is the biggest example of legacy operators, you know, trying to go ahead and continue on, still doing all right and having the chance to go ahead and operate, but not being shut down. It's that's real social equity at its core. What do you say about what the so that we get in that that environment that's really specific and very unique to any other market out there? It is, but it isn't. So let me let me say this. Sure, what you say is it, is correct. Here's the problem: you you had a rider from from Maryland, from Andy Harris, who's a U.S. congressman from Eastern mm -hmm. Maryland, who said that if the district gets a recreational or adult use business. 
license, then it was going to prohibit Maryland. Um, it, it, it would take tax dollars out of Maryland, right? Now Maryland is legally right. We still we still have this right over our head. But as you know, back in last December, we got 13 uh, laws passed or revisions to the current um, can at that at that point was the the um, the amendments were passed. And one of the things was that basically it was to take unlicensed business to license within a year. So as of this month, up until January, at the end of this month to January, I can't remember. And it's people like myself who are legacy, who are I-71 gifting shops, has the ability to get a cannabis license. Mm -hmm. DC's problem though, is that a lot of these guys don't feel comfortable because the cultivation in DC has been the biggest issue. So they think that, hey, even though if I go get a license, you're still setting me up to fail because DC has not solved the cultivation issue as of yet. Although we've applied for cultivation license, it takes about two years minimum to get up a full ramp up cultivation program. You look at states like New Jersey, you look at uh, New York right now, um, Massachusetts had that problem, uh, Connecticut is having that problem. When you have more people, it's supply and demand. And if you don't have the supply, people are going to continue to do legacy stores like myself. But the district is saying after a certain amount of days, if you don't have these licenses, we're going to enforce. And I understand both sides of the coin. So as a person who advocates every day, what we're advocating for is saying, hey, let's fix our cultivation problem so that we can have a robust and a thriving cannabis market. Let's do it right. Let's show the country that a 8.8 square mile city or territory can do this thing right. And so that's what I fight for. That's what I 71 fight for every day. And that's, you know, so again, our abilities to say, hey, yeah, we are legacy and we're social equity. We're inclined to definitely yeah. do it right. But the tools that we're fighting with right now is like a nuclear missile versus someone has a bazooka. And and the reason I say that is, is that the district, the the legislators here, some understand, but most don't. And they care, they they have they they're carrying this nuclear weapon against us to say, oh, you guys are doing it wrong. You're hating, mm -hmm. hating or on the medical market, or you're not working with the medical market. But let let me say this. The medical market is suffering as well because they can't, the, the, the cultivation here is of poor or mid-level quality. Right. And that's what you get. So you get this impasse of two markets, both want to thrive, but they're looking for the same thing, the right product. Right. At the moment, they're saying that was August of this year that these dispensaries only sold a little over one and a half million dollars in cannabis in August. And that's what's going so far. Cultivation centers sold a little bit more than last month, but the dispensary sales have been dropping since the Maryland market opened for legal adult use. We're off the bat. So that's the the part is coming across. And with 68 square miles, or as we were, uh, right, what do we have now? I think it was uh, 68 square, it was 60 square miles. Yes. That's all you have. And how much of that is possibly available for cultivation space if you're going to do it within the district is there something where there can be some kind of a you know a point where maryland can also because of the adult use is there any way to get it where maryland can be used for cultivation and be brought into dc the only way that that's going to happen if the federal if the federal government allows the interstate commerce and for those who do not know what interstate commerce it'll just like alcohol it allows that a a drug or substance can come over a, from state to state over its border or its providence. And in in that, right now, the federal government with cannabis not being legal on a federal level, that's not going to happen. We don't have banking, so that's another issue. So the district right now is like, hey, okay, we're going to have but so many cultivators, right? 
we're all fighting for space. I'm fighting for a cultivation license right now. I want to be vertically integrated. If you don't have the space and the ability, but you got to understand, D.C. is a city of about 800,000 plus people. But D.C. is also a city that sees over 31 million people a year and, and that visit the district. And so it's just not those 800,000 people. Yeah, that's your base. That's your core people. That That's your everyday people who live in the neighborhood. But for those who visit the city and they're looking for adult use cannabis, that's what they're looking for. How can I get a quality product in a safe environment and that, that gives me the experience that I get in California, in Colorado, or anywhere else in this country that's legal? And, and for us, that's what Marco is about. Building that and understanding, hey, one customer at a time and giving them that experience. Now, is there anything coming up now in terms of possible ballot initiatives or amendments that are coming up, say, in the 2024 election? Is there anything right now that can be done where petitions can be put in place and D.C. could go ahead and go to the route and not have to be behooven to the I-71 uh case and be able to go and just become adult use can they put can there be about an issue put in place to make that possible just to go ahead and make dc much like maryland well first of all the the router act has to be removed in order for the the, the router to be removed congress has to to balance the budget good luck with that right right second of all is a, a router cannot be introduced or removed because of what they call a good faith or a, um, a, I can't remember the term off the top of my head, but basically saying that, hey, if something's introduced and a rider has been voted on, it cannot be replaced. Neither can it be reintroduced at the time until that budget is, re- is, is, is met. Now, and there's nothing that Mayor Bowser has ever done, or just where you said the DC Council, where they've looked at something because they're not a state. I mean, I don't know what the, the rules are of the governing body for a district, but if there's something there they can do that could be much like what a state can do. They can't do anything because of yeah. the rider. And and so the, the, the I-71 came along because of the rider. Right. And and then you have to understand too is is that when we are trying to get adult use, um, we're hoping that the DEA will Deschedule cannabis from a one to a three. So if it they deschedule it, then you can have adult use because now it's no longer a schedule one. It's a schedule three, which in turns makes it recreational. So right. there's some things, but we're still waiting on the federal. We have to, you have to understand the mayor has done all everything she can from right. a standpoint of what what she's she's bound by. Her powers are, and she, she she has handcuffs because we, and when when I tell the story, you you mentioned Mayor Barry, right? Right. The the when Mayor Barry got arrested and convicted, the federal government took its power back from the district, and that was one of the things that they wanted to be able to control the district, and and that's why you you have what we have today. We have to depend on our federal counterparts to make um, legislation that will allow us locally to live by um, and, 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 and abide by the cannabis laws based on their legislation and not ours. Our local legislators are depending on them, um, their counterparts, to make these rules and regulations so that it can take it off their plate. But in the meantime, we have to go from a license to a license and abide by what's coming. And what we're trying to do here now is to live in that box or in that space um, as comfortable as possible until we get help from our federal counterparts. Rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more Blunt Business. Welcome back to Blunt Business. What I want to know now is, what is being done in terms of with initiative 71 i-71 because of the fact that in states you have a control board you have some kind of an infrastructure a framework put together 
for that. So who's doing the part of policing all the operators to make sure they're above board, that there's compliance in place? Obviously, they're not going to have a metric in place. They're not going to have anything like that. But we're, you know, who's holding the shops accountable among the shops? Well, the R71 uh, committee, uh, we have 28 members. Um, we pay taxes. We're registered with the Office of Tax and Revenue. We have a, a CFO to operate, and we have a business license. Now, there's other bad actors out there. Um, and what the city has said, if you're not doing these things, trying to get a pathway to a license, you're a bad actor, right? So they're giving that space from, I think, the mid uh, starts the end of October to the beginning of January for you to get a license. But you have to have a clean hands, which means you got to pay your taxes. That your business license has to be in order. That you know you have to have all the T's dotted and the I. I mean, all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. Excuse me. If you don't, then ABBA or CABA, which is the cannabis board, then will enforce alone, and they will be, be because of what was passed last December. Then MPD gets involved. If you do not have a um, conditional license to continue to operate, then they will get, begin to raid. That's my understanding. Now, um, am I agreeing with it? I absolutely am. Because as someone who's tried to do it right, and as someone who's tried to set the culture in the metric bar to be very high in this city, I expect that my counterparts um, in this illicit market, in this I-71 market, do as I do. And followed by the same rules that I followed by, because guess what? In order for us to ever make the necessary steps, we have to make sure that we're following the necessary rules in order to make those steps. Now, what you do have in place at, at the moment, besides the I-71 uh, statute, is that as of this past March, uh, Mayor Bowser, and it was uh, signed and it was an act into law, the Medical Cannabis Amendment Act of 2022, MCAA. So a medical program, medical program you do have now serving almost 29,000 UC DC, DC resident patients and thousands of non-DC resident patients. What can you tell me about where the medical program is there and what that helps out? Because obviously with that, then you obviously do have a governing body within the cannabis industry to handle through the Alcohol, Beverage, and Cannabis Administration, APCA. So what happens now with the medical side? Is that something that changes how the stores are being operated at all? Or is that something that you would take advantage of? We, we will all have a medical license um, okay. under the new license um, structure. But here's the problem. As I said, DC got 800,000 people, right? You just yeah. had 9,000 medical car holders, right? Numbers don't add up. And the reason is, is that you can't have a medical card if you have a federal, federal job or you have, if you possessed a gun. And if you think about that, most women who are single parents who live in a household in the district with that's in crime, whatever, whatever neighborhood you live, rather than have a, a gun to protect their house than a medical cannabis uh, uh, um, bar. So then go to the next factor. If you take that, I am a GS-14. I make $140,000, $50,000, $60,000 a year. You think I'm going to give my job up to smoke cannabis or to see no. I got, no, you're not going to do that. You're not going to do that. The numbers don't add up. And so when we're going into this medical world or this medical providence that they want us from a license standpoint, who's going to buy cannabis? And we're, we're, we're forced to go into a space and fight for 29,000 people. When there's 800,000 people that live in this area. And like you said, there a lot of them have federal jobs. Terrence, you know what, man? I, I knew I was going to be interested when once I got this uh, opportunity to do this interview. But Jesus Christ, that is a cluster up there that you're dealing with. I do not envy what you, the your fellow members of the committee, and what you as a business owner up there have to go through right now. I mean, it's like... I did. I honestly never knew it could be this complicated or this, you know, the, what a tangled web it is. But I'm, I mean, but after all this, 
you have to at least, I mean, the fact that you really have the I-71 clause, you have it here, and that this committee, obviously, it's imperative in the District of Columbia that all those business owners, along with yourself, are continue to fight the fight because this is a very, is very strategic and, and very complicated. It is. And, it, you know, I thank you for the opportunity again of um, to, number one, allow me to speak, you know, on behalf of myself, the I-71 committee and all the other um, I- I-71 uh, stores in the area. Um, it's it's a, 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 a privilege and honor to do so. Um, but I, I, I say this. This this particular beehive or waltz nest is a different type of fight. Yeah. But I told myself when I got into this business, if I couldn't get a seat at the table, I wasn't going to do it. And, and you know, I've been fortunate enough to get a seat at the table because of I-71 um, in the committee. Um, but I've also um, been forced to continue to fight for people of color like myself and, you know, return citizens like myself who want the opportunity to prove to the world that, hey, you know, we made a mistake in life. You know, we're trying to do it right. But what we have here is a conundrum of local government who, on one hand, they want a robust or thriving market, but they don't understand how it works. And until that, until we all can get on the same line or on the same platform to fight the same fight, it's going to continue to be this way. So in the, you know, the last year or so, I got to talk to the folks of the Justice Foundation. We've had a chance to interview with the folks at Urban Aroma, those that are also putting the fight up for legacy operators. And I've said it constantly on this program and on Bum Business that if you want to talk about social equity, you have to put the legacy operators into the discussion. And what you're dealing with right now, it's exactly what it is right now with I-71. In, Washington, in, in District of Columbia. So you, the prime examples of legacy operators, the plight, the struggle, but also doing as a collective, doing right and, and be able to go and serve the public there, 800,000 folks, whoever can be able to go and get their hands on cannabis and make it possible for them to go ahead and buy and, and, and enjoy it. Have you had, gotten a lot of contact from those that are trying to help in that cause? Any, a lot of social equity organizations or those and, and I mean how much response have you gotten from the fact that from a legacy operator standpoint, what these other states need to be understanding that how important legacy operators are to this space as opposed to just giving someone new a social equity provision license that might be able to go and start a business up, might figure it out, but might ultimately fail as well. Well here's a problem. You look at a state like New York, there's a ton of gray market or illicit um, legacy stores in New York. Absolutely. But if you look at the promises on the social equity side, you had a lot of celebrities saying, I'm going to give, I got a fund of 200, 300 million dollars. Never came to fruition. Yeah. So how can you ask a guy who's been hustling all his life to give up 51%, give 51% control, but only have 10% equity? You want to basically use them like a shell, a tool. Then, if it did, if they step out on their own, they don't. They can get the license, but they don't have the resources. Yeah. So as I sit on DEI, you know, panels and and and, and, and conferences and things like of that nature, and we talk about social equity. There's no social equity without justice. There's no justice without appropriations. And you, you can you can chalk it up the way you want to. They can paint yeah. this pretty picture like, oh yeah, if we're going to give two hundred licenses and we're going to do this and that. Where's the funding? Where are the resources? Right. I say that this guy can thrive or this woman can thrive or what to be successful in a market that's of MSO big money, old white guys, excuse me, that got a uh, uh, tons of lines of credit and they got old money everywhere and they say, hey. We can put, we can lose money in New York until this and that. We 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 mom and pop, we're black and brown, right? We 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 can't do it. Jeez. And so 
the the issue is is yeah. You look at social equity. You look at Kiki Davis in L in L A. She sued the city of Los Angeles and the state of California for those two hundred licenses. They settled on a hundred, right? Yeah. Ask me how many of those hundred. I don't know the number, but I'm I want to know how many of those hundred licenses that were social ed has survived are thriving businesses today in the state of, of California, in the city of, of Los Angeles. Couldn't tell you. But I'm pretty sure if I was the bed man, it would be less than 25. Well, because they don't want to, well, the, the media is not going to report that. They, oh, they'll oh. report, oh, we got your business open. Look, we they're open up. Look at this great grand opening. They won't tell you about what happened if they stay if they survived or not. You, know, I'm doing a big celebration on the 18th. I've been open a year. The first month in business, I made $37,000. Now, yeah. I can tell you I'm on pace to do about over $4 million, uh for the year. Wow. But that's working 75, 80 hours every week. Oh, yeah. I went to the doctor in March. He told me, if you don't take a vacation, I'm putting you in the hospital. Oh, man. So- let me tell you, as a gentleman who's turning 51, God bless, on the 27th of this month, if you want to get into a business that everything is against you because of your skin color and because of what you've been through in life and because of the resources, don't get in cannabis. Everybody think it's sweet. I'm going to get a lot of money. I'm going to do that. It ain't that way. Right. It's, it, 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 it's not that way. It's not the streets. And yeah. so what I could, what I tell people when they ask me is if you do not, if, if, if you don't, it, it's two things in life to be successful. You got to breathe and you got to walk. Yeah. First and foremost, cannabis will take the air out of your body and the, your legs from underneath you. Yeah. If you're not careful. And that's, that's not a lie. That's the truth. Yeah. That's wow, man. Well, that's a lot. I you you laid it out perfectly. I'll tell you, I never knew, never knew. But this is why I like doing these shows. This right here is important, and I want this board to get out there. So let's get people to go ahead and know more. First of all, I want to go ahead and make sure everybody knows about the I seventy one committee. The letter I seventy one committee dot org. The I seventy one committee dot org. You can find all the information there. And for those that want to go ahead and jump on board, even if they're not in District of Columbia, what can they do? How can they help? Well, first and foremost, we can you can write uh Congress with Andy Harris and tell him let's let's get a budget pass so that he can take the ride off DC. So that DC can be a adult use and that we can play by the same laws that everybody else is playing by. Second of all is support your local I-71 business. If you're visiting the district, if you got a favorite place, if you don't, you can, you more than welcome to come to Marco. I'm at 444 K street Northwest. And, but continue to voice your voice, your opinion, help your veterans, help your local causes that want to support cannabis, not only on a municipal uh, level, but on a uh, adult use level. Um, and most of all, Continue to speak up for things that you believe in. Marijuana is not the, the thing of the 60s and 70s. Let's let's relieve the stench and stigma. Let's let's be free will like we use alcohol. Let's ha- let's be able to indulge in a community, in in a a culture, and in a business just like everything else, without people frowning upon us. And so we want to make sure also the mention you mentioned the uh, the store again four 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 K Street Northwest and the website is monco m o n k o dot c o m o n k o dot c o and for those that can be looking at the website you're looking at where you have flower pre rolls edibles vaporizers but also look at that they're being featured as gifts and there are points associated to each gift so real quick of the products you have. In store, what can you tell me about those? A little bit of what's been highlighted. People that haven't been able to go and frequent the store. What has really been popular? What are people really, really uh, attaching to? 
Well, of course, you know, your your edibles is is the biggest thing. Um, our flowers, you know, it has been, you know, we get rave reviews. Um, most of our products here are very, uh, you know, people love. I, I believe in quality, uh, not quantity. And I, you know, I'm not the store that you go in and get quantity. I'm in the store that you come in or the dispensary, you come in and you get quality. Um, and so most of the products, all of the products here are quality products. Um, we thrive on that and that, you know, and we we like to understand, we like to present a experience. We're going to find out what brings you in. Is it something recreational? Are you dealing with pain? Are you can't sleep? We're going to make sure we put you in the right product. And and that's one of the things that, uh, you know, I've been proud of uh, in, in training our staff on is just presenting the right experience and being educational about the things that we do until the point where um, starting October the 17th, we're doing our first class on microdosing um, THC from an educational standpoint and teaching people how to actually microdose and what what is needed, the, the ins and outs of it. Right. Wonderful. So again, the i71committee.org, monco.ko. Again, been joined here with Terrence White, CEO of, is this will be CEO and founder of Cannabis Lifestyle Brand, Monco, M-O-N-K-O dot C-O and chairman of the I-71 committee. Terrence, thank you for opening my eyes to this, and I hope our audience really gets into this, and they ha hopefully will reach out to you and support you and your and all the causes right there along uh, the District of Columbia and all the businesses like yourself. Really appreciate thank you. you and the, the opportunity, and I appreciate it. Um, and if anything, if you're ever in D.C. or you need me for anything else, please don't hesitate to reach out. Fantastic. And thank you, folks, for listening. We'll talk to you next time.